Hello, welcome everyone. I'm glad to glad to see so many people here. Uh, this is our how to think about modeling COVID uh, discussion. Um, I am Will Mackey, I'm a senior associate in the uh, at Grad Institute working with the health program and Annika Stobart is an associate working with the health program. Uh, I'll just give people <clears throat> maybe a minute to trickle in. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. It should be a very interesting chat. Okay, we might um, we might get started. So, how to think about modeling COVID? Uh, today, we're going to cover two kind of er two areas of modeling that we have. Um, that we've undertaken at Grattan. Uh, the first is modeling the spread and transmission and consequences of that transmission for, for COVID, and then also modeling the vaccine rollout. Um, two you know, very important issues. Uh, Grattan has done lots of work in the COVID space um, since 2020. Um, it's you know, the, the public policy topic of our times, really. Um, we, we, we've been strong advocates uh, for the zero COVID approach, our report uh, towards the end of 2020, um, go for zero, talked about, you know, why we need, why zero COVID in a world without vaccines, why zero COVID is the best approach. It leads to fewer deaths, shorter recessions, uh, and fewer days of restrictions. Um, kind of, you get the best of all worlds. And we did that. We did that really successfully. I think we can kind of, we can conclude that that was a, a policy win um, for, for Australia. But it comes at a, a huge cost. Lockdowns and restrictions, they are the best or they're, they're the better of the two outcomes if, if the other is kind of um, a, a more, more deaths and more, more days of restrictions. Locking down early is, is the best, but that, it's really costly. Lockdowns um, are, are terrible. They're, they're really bad and we would like to find a way out. Vaccines give us that way out um, so we can kind of start to return to normal. And... Really, what we need to work out now is kind of what is the vaccination level required to, to start to open up, to start opening borders, to start um, uh, uh, kind of removing the need for, for restrictions and lockdowns and those kind of things. We've used uh, kind of Grattan in the COVID space. Uh, we are public policy experts. We speak to lots and lots of experts. We, we kind of have a very strong engagement with, um, for, for this project, uh, for instance, public health, uh, infectious disease experts and modelers, epidemiologists, uh, vaccine rollout and hesitancy experts, public health officials, then virologists, general modelers, economists, bureaucrats and decision makers, all of these people kind of have, have expertise uh, in, in kind of how, how we can, get through this pandemic, what's going to happen. And we kind of combine all of this knowledge to consider how the disease spreads uh, and the consequences if it does, maybe how, how we could slow or stop the spread, whether we actually want to slow or stop the spread, um, and various outcomes and their, their costs and benefits. And, and we kind of, we do that to then communicate it to the Australian people, to decision makers, um, to kind of a to you know making sure that we're all making you know we're following the best path, the path that achieves the best outcomes for the Australian people, and we we use modelling to kind of answer to to, to answer policy relevant questions. Um, model modelling allows us to combine lots of different expert research and advice and turn it into usable information. Um, modelling is really quite general. We all, we all do kind of modeling, we all have mental models about the how, how the world works. Um, models can be really simple or complex. Uh, it, it is just, it is a process by which you, you kind of better understand the world. And that's, that's what we do, that, you know, that's why we use modeling to better understand the world. It also helps us understand interactions within systems, like what matters. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of the questions that we'll talk about uh, later in this presentation, you know, does closing schools stop the spread or help prevent the spread of COVID by how much? 
you know, we know we can combine all the things we know about, you know, transmission of COVID or, or how kids transmit COVID, um, put them into a, a model and see kind of what happens if you close schools. This kind of view of modeling also means that different modeling of the same phenomenon um, is, is really useful. There's no kind of one model to rule them all. Every modeling exercise uh, will, will have a question um, and, and you, you kind of, you design your model, you make it complex where you need to make it complex and simple where you need to, uh, where you can make it simple to better understand the world. And so you can have, these have been called competing models. They're not kind of competing models. Um, each model helps us understand the world and or, or some particular uh, uh, kind of way or, or fe feature of, of COVID. And so we can think, I'll just run through a simple model to get us started. Because um, I know modeling can be, uh, you know, seem, seem prohibitive to, to some people, especially a, a general audience. I think we, we all need to understand modeling a little bit better and, and not, not kind of be scared by it. It is something that we all need to engage with and understand uh, and think about. And so get, getting started with a simple model, if we know that 3.2% of 50 year olds who get COVID end up in the ICU, so this is a stat from the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System, uh, a, a stat that they've put out recently. Then our model here would be we're looking for an output. There is a function and an input. So ICU demand for 50-year-olds for is equal to the rate for 50-year-olds times the number of COVID cases for 50-year-olds. And so we could write that you know, mathematically, Simple model, ICU 50 year olds equals, is equal to 3.2% times the number of cases. And this helps answer a really specific policy question. You know, the question is how, how, many, how many 50 year old ICU patients should we expect if a thousand 50 year olds get COVID? Now this model makes key assumptions. Like this is a very simple model, but we're already making a pretty key assumption here by using historical data to predict the future or better understand the future. So here the ICU rates on the right, if you look on the right, right hand side, uh, the kind of key assumptions here, the ICU rates for 50 year olds is the same in the future as it was in the past. Now this might be not true, this might be different. You know, pre-ICU treatment might improve, which means fewer 50 year olds who get COVID end up in the ICU. Alternatively, more people die from COVID, could die from COVID before they ever reach the ICU or a more dominant variant leads to more or less ICU demand. So these are things, you know, we, we don't throw out the model because it might be different in the future. Instead, we kind of, we, we use that 3.2%, but we understand that there is some uncertainty and we research and we try and work out what direction that uncertainty is gonna push us in. And so we, we wanna use modeling to help well, modeling can be used to help answer policy questions, help aid our thinking about policy questions. And so I'll run through kind of six questions here that you kind of will all be familiar with if you're engaged in, in um, being engaged with COVID in, in Australia. So kind of our first one, our really simple model that we went through before, how many people will end, will end up in the ICU if a thousand people get COVID? Another question might be, how many people will become infected if COVID spreads without intervention? How many people will die if COVID spreads without intervention? How does closing schools affect community transmission? When will Sydney get out of lockdown? And then our question, or uh, the question that Grant Institute has been exploring, when will ICU be overwhelmed if COVID spreads? spreads when 80% of the population is vaccinated. So these are all, all kind of questions. You can use different models and different kind of understandings of the world to answer these questions. And we'll go through them. So how many people will end up in the ICU if a thousand people get COVID? We had a very simple example before using 50 year olds. Now we want to expand that to the whole population. So if we know the rates of ICU use for infected people by age group, our model here is kind of very similar to the one we looked at before. ICU demand is equal to the sum of uh, the ICU rate by age times the number of people who get COVID in that age group. 
And we could think of this, this is kind of how we write it up, you know, now my coding, coding language say, um, uh, uh, you know, ICU demand is equal to the sum of all of these interactions. So at the top there, the ICU rate for zero to nine year olds uh, times the number of cases, uh, COVID cases of zero to nine year olds. And we have this data again, um, it was sourced from the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System. Um, we, we, we have this data. So we can look at ICU admissions by age, see on the very right hand side there, their proportions. Um, so here we're saying, what is, uh, what, 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 is um, what, what, what do we expect for each age group? What's their I ICU utilization? Now this helps answer an important policy question, but it has one condition. So how many people end up in the ICU if a thousand people get COVID? Well, it depends. It depends on the, on the ages of, of the people who get COVID. So if cases are distributed equally among the population, maybe we'll end up with 23 ICU patients. But if they skew old, as we've seen, you know, if there are outbreaks in, in, uh, uh, among older Australians, middle-aged Australians, um, that, then maybe there'll be more ICU, ICU demands. And if it spreads through the younger population who are far less likely to use um, to, to need to use IC, ICU, uh, then it's going to spread. Uh, so the, then, then we're going to have less ICU demand. And so we have these, so, you know, on the right hand side there, looking at the assumptions, kind of what assumptions are applied by this model. Again, we have, um, again, we have these assumptions that the past or the future is going to be similar to the past. And that may not be true, may not be right. And so we've got to kind of think through that. Um, and also we've got to think about may maybe some complexity that might be useful to aid our understanding of this. Our second question, um, and this is very uh, kind of a key question at the beginning of this pandemic, um, how many people will become infected if COVID spreads without intervention? So what information do we need here? We need the size of the susceptible population. We need how many people each person is likely to infect. Uh, when everyone is susceptible, so is it the R0 or the, the effective reproduction number? And that reproduction number means for every one in for every one infection, how many how many people are they likely to infect? R0 means the entire population is susceptible. The effective reproduction number is kind of how that how how that number plays out in society. So if there are restrictions uh, or lockdowns or people wearing masks, all of these are going to reduce the R0. So the uh, and kind of turn it into the effective reproduction number. Um, and we also need the serial interval. So how quickly a newly infectious person can infect others. With that information, see on the right-hand side, this is a model uh, generated by uh, the epidemiologist, Tony Blakely, for the conversation in March, where we're just getting to understand COVID and how, kind of, how COVID works. Um, his model here, the very, that very light, uh, um, case at the beginning without any intervention whatsoever, you get kind of 500,000 new infections per day um, before the disease runs out of people to infect. So this is like really useful. It, it's, it, it, is, it is very useful. It answers a particular policy question. It's good to know. We might also need some information about how an infection lasts, how long a person is infectious for, and also there's gonna be complicating factors demographic differences in, in infectiousness, for example, kids, you know, may be less likely uh, to spread the disease. Um, and so you kind of, you want to build that into your model, but still, you know, even without that information, this is, gives us a, a nice simple understanding of how the disease spreads and what the consequences, well, moving on, we can then look at the consequences of that COVID spread. So what information here, for, for this third question of how many people will die of COVID spreads, we, we need that same information. So the size of the population, how many people each person is likely to infect and the serial interval. We also need the infection fatality ratio, uh, which is the proportion of people who become infected who end up dying. And there are also complicating factors here like we had before, you know, demographic differences. Kids are not only maybe less likely to, to get and spread the disease, but they're also really less likely to, to die. And that's an important note here, um, especially with COVID. COVID is very age dependent. And I think, you know, that's something we, we learned quite early on. It, it, 
it, it, it, it infects and harms older people much more than it than it does kids uh, or, or young, young, younger people. And so it's important to build that into your model, which, which we'll go through in a second. So another question, very policy relevant, uh, especially kind of last year or kind of as we're going into or as uh, New South Wales and Queensland going into lockdown now, what happens if we close schools or, you know, any, any, any place? What happens if we close Bunnings? Or, or other retail. Um, so what information do we need here? This is different. So we don't need, or we can't use a kind of a ref or a, a, a reproduction number here. We actually need, but you know, the size and characteristics of the population, but we need the places that people go and the characteristics of those places. So here we could think of if a, a school, you know, we know the school, a classroom, 20 kids, um, we also need to know how many, how many, how many additional kids uh, one, in, one infected person is likely to infect. It's called the attack rate uh, in each of these scenarios. And so this is, um, this is taken from the Burnett Institute, who have a fantastic model called Covasim, and they have this functionality built in. And so for each place on the left-hand side there, this, they, they call it a layer. Um, they have Different, different places that people, people go. They go to they have households, aged care, schools, low risk work, high risk work. In each of those places, there's an average number of contacts. Then for each of those places, again, transmission probability uh, uh, relative to, to the household. The household is more, you know, you're much more likely to spread COVID in a, in a household. Um, so, so kind of combining all of these different things, all of these interactions, you put people into a model, this allows you, uh, as the Burnett Institute have done um, throughout the pandemic, uh, allows you to say, what happens if we close schools or open schools or close childcare, have people wearing masks, et cetera, et cetera. These are really, these kind of big complex agent-based models are really useful because you can kind of explore very specific policy scenarios. This is the kind of modeling that um, that's the, Department, the Victorian Department of Health when I was there last year, was using um, we, we used both um, models developed by the University of Melbourne, people like Jason Thompson, uh, and also the Burnett Institute's agent-based modeling. Really useful to kind of explore these these questions. Uh, so that University of Melbourne model um, has been used in an article recently by uh, uh, Jason Thompson and Tony Tony Blakely and some others. Um, to say kind of when will Sydney get out of lockdown? So they run a bunch of different simulations um, to, to say kind of there's 100 new cases now, what's it going to look like in the future? And you can see here is a really key feature of this model and all modelling, uh, the uncertainty. These are simulations, there's lots of chance. Uh, what you have to look for is the kind of the plausible ranges. You can get lucky, un lucky here, as you can see on the very left-hand side, say, cases drop down to zero. Um, the median line is in the middle uh, in, in black. Um, you could get out unlucky though. You could do exactly the same thing um, and COVID still spreads just because you, you hit a super spreader event or, or kind of something unlucky happened. And it was this kind of agent-based, uh, kind of complex agent-based modeling that has been used throughout the pandemic really kind of successfully to, to emphasize the idea of chance or, or luck. Um, or, or uh, uncertainty. You could do exactly the same thing, uh, roll the dice with new cases and different outcomes will happen. So different things will, will happen. And now we get to our model and we have a very specific question, which is what vaccination level will allow low level restrictions while not overwhelming the healthcare system. And really kind of, you can translate that question is like, if we open up for a given vaccination level, what might happen? There's lots of evidence, like an enormous amount of evidence. There's lots of unknowns. There's lots of uncertainty. Uh, and I think one kind of key bit of uncertainty that we're experiencing now is you could kind of think of 2020 as the entire world of researchers trying to understand COVID, the wild type, um, the original COVID. Um, and that took a long time, you know, lots of, you know, hundreds of thousands of papers and, and millions of researchers all putting in time to try and understand how the disease spreads. And it was complex. We now 
have even more complexity, more uncertainty, because we have vaccines, not just one vaccine, but multiple vaccines, different dosages of those vaccines, and also you know, different durations since you got the vaccine. All of these things change how, how COVID kind of spreads uh, uh, and how, how much it affects you. And then also we have different variants. So we're not just battling the wild type. Um, instead, we're trying to, we, we need to work out how the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, the second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine reduces the probability of hospitalization for the Delta strain. Uh, like we need to repeat that for the for Pfizer for one and two doses, et cetera, et cetera. So it's important here to, to understand what we don't know. Uh, there is lots of uncertainty. And I think I'll say here, you know, our modeling is done with information that we know now, um, but we're going to learn more. We're going to learn more about Delta. We're going to learn more about the vaccines. And there may be additional variants uh, that kind of come into play that will change these, these modeling outcomes, that will change these dynamics. Um, and so it is quite a, you know, a dynamic decision-making process. I know it's, you know, very, we, we kind of, Need to have targets and plans and things we can actually hold on to, but be aware that there's lots of uncertainty, things can change. Um, and so we should all be kind of updating our understanding of, of how COVID spreads as we learn more uh, throughout the year. But that's not to say that we can't use this information at all. We shouldn't just fly blind because there's uncertainty or unknowns. Uh, we need to kind of combine the information we have in the best way possible to understand how you know, to, to kind of inform decision making. And that's what we're doing. And this is kind of what Doherty has been tasked to do by the government in their modeling that was released recently. Uh, Burnett Institute has been doing University of Sydney uh, and the University of Melbourne as well. Lots of researchers are uh, kind of building models using the information we have to kind of understand uh, code a little bit better. So I'm gonna run through now our model. Um, it, it's called the COVID ref model. Pretty simple name. It's written in R um, for all the R fans out there, are predominantly using data tables, even though I'm a Tardiverse fan. Data tables just quicker. Um, sorry to annoy anyone with that. Uh, our model focuses on the spread of COVID and its health consequences in a partially vaccinated society. And they're kind of the key things. And we don't want to overcomplicate it. We don't need to. And so well, what we actually need here is the Australian population by age, the transmission or the, the, the effective reproduction number in the Australian society. So not the R0, we want the REF. Um, we need to look at vaccination effectiveness by type, what kind of protection offers against symptomatic infection, hospitalization and death. We need the proportion of the population who is vaccinated by age, Again, you know, the age has to be a key feature in any model for COVID because it's so age dependent. Um, we also have to incorporate vaccine distribution. So for a given group, how much are people getting Pfizer, how much are people getting AstraZeneca? Um, and then also how dangerous is COVID? You know, what's, how likely are you in, to end up in hospital um, or die by age um, without a vaccine? And there's more, there's more kind of more that goes into, the, into our model and you can look at the, the code or the technical appendix that we have up on the Grattan website. Um, but these are kind of the key things. These are the things that we spent a lot of time exploring. And so what isn't in our model? Restrictions aren't in our model. So we kind of, our goal for this modeling exercise is to say, when can we open up when a kind of obtrusive was our word, when are obtrusive restrictions um, unlikely to be needed? So we don't include restrictions. Other models do include kind of heavier restrictions. So the Doherty Institute, uh, you know, their baseline or low-level restrictions uh, are kind of more obtrusive than what we assume. Um, we don't have any dynamic behavioral change. So both policymakers and people respond to different levels of COVID in the community. Um, you know, you'll, if there's lots of COVID and you don't want to catch it, you'll stay inside. Uh, we don't model that because it's something we want to get away from, as in we don't want that behavioral change. Uh, we, we, we don't include networks. Um, that's that bit of complexity, I don't think is needed for our, our kind of modeling exercise, so it would be useful. 
And we don't we don't need agent based interactions in places. So you know we were looking before at the Burnett um, and Doherty, oh, sorry the Burnett Institute modeling, looking at all their places. We don't need that level of complexity. We just focus on the rare. Um, this stuff, yeah, not the focus of our model. So let's get into it. Uh, this I'm just going to run through how our model works step by step. Um, Chuck up any questions, I'll try and get to them at the end. Um, and also for your questions, make sure you're kind of looking and voting, see uh, keep your questions uh, at the top, be nice. Um, so at day zero, day zero in our model starts with every person in the Australian population, um, each with an age, that's their kind of characteristic, very important for COVID. Some of these people start vaccinated, uh, some with Pfizer, first or second dose, some with AstraZeneca first or second dose. Some people are infected, which is bad. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. This is, um, you know, the data set of the entire Australian population, the 26 million or so. Um, and so this is what it looks like at the beginning. So on day one, the simulation, sorry, on day one, the simulation starts, the infected people, uh, from day zero might infect others. And so step one, one infected unvaccinated person has a close contact with three unvaccinated, three vaccinated people and two un unvaccinated people. So here like the rec is five, they would have infected all of these people uh, if it weren't for vaccines, what happens with vaccines? And so step two here is the close contacts who, who would have become infected, some get protection uh, if, the, if they're vaccinated. And so here, instead of infecting five people, this person has infected three. And so we can see just in this very, very small simulation, uh, the, the ref is kind of already reduced uh, from five to three. And this is based, uh, this kind of protection, this protection against symptomatic in infection is based on research published in the Lancet, um, based on, on the UK uh, data as well. We use Canadian. Uh, uh, studies from Canadian data as well, because they look at the interaction between uh, vaccines, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, um, and, uh, and the Delta variants, which we're, we're focused on. So continuing our day one, we have these three people who are infected, two are unvaccinated, one is vaccinated. So what do we need to know? What are we interested in? I want to know whether or not these people are going to end up in the ICU. And so our model here for ICU is based on, again, from that age table that we saw before. Uh, so what's the likelihood these people are aged 30, 70, and 60? So the top person here, um, the top person here is 30 years old. So they have ICU chance of 0.7, but they're also vaccinated. So they get this protection from their double vaccination of, of Pfizer or AstraZeneca. The other two don't, so they have higher probabilities of ending up in the ICU. These, pro these likelihoods are then calculated. They're thrown off against a random number to decide whether or not um, this person ends up in the ICU here. So the kind of outcomes here for the first person who was vaccinated, uh, their, their likelihood is very low, They're thrown, thrown a higher number so they don't end up in the ICU. But the next two do, they get kind of unlucky actually. Then we want to know whether or not kind of how long do they stay in the ICU? That's really important um, because the longer somebody stays in an ICU, that kind of adds to your demand over time. Um, that this is going to depend on whether or not they require mechanical ventilation. That's going to increase your length of stay. So we get this uh, from a, a paper by um, Burrell et al, uh, who looked kind of looked at the entire data set of uh, ICU patients um, in Australia to do with COVID between uh, you know, throughout all of 2020. We look at the second wave um, as, as the ICU practices kind of changed. Um, here, if the person needs a mechanical ventilator, the length of stay is going to be longer. How long do, do, do they stay? That's a, It's going to be drawn from a random distribution, so a distribution of the length of stay. You can see here on the bottom left that chart. Most people stay in the ICU, but, you know, one to 10 days, but there are some who stay for much longer. Um, and that's kind of, that's important. That tail is really important. This uses a, a log normal distribution for those who care. Um, 
uh, that kind of length of stay is important. So each person who in our model, each person who ends up in the ICU is going to have a length of stay that's drawn from this kind of distribution based on whether or not they need a mechanical ventilator, of which about half of them do. We also want to know whether or not they uh, die. So this little model here, uh, this is from um, Gideon Meyer's cats, the uh, FDMLs uh, at the University of Wollongong, um, and, and co-authors who uh, kind of did a pretty substantial literature or meta-analysis to determine the infection fatality rate by age uh, without vaccination, pre-vaccination, also pre-Delta. Um, this death likelihood function is then based on age, and your, your, your likelihood of death is greatly reduced if you have a vaccination based on those tables that I presented previously. So here, our three people, they get an infection fatality, right, or they get a death likelihood uh, that's then reduced by a vac vaccine if they are vaccinated. Um, if the person is, uh, if, if the random number that is generated then is less than that, that person in our model um, will, will be recorded as a death. And so here we have two people who do, did not die and one person who did. And so this is like kind of the end of day one. So this, we, we have our outcomes. Day one, one introduced infection, three local cases, one vaccinated, uh, two unvaccinated, two people in ICU, one stays for two days, one stays for 20 days, and one person died. And then we repeat that day after day. So now day five, about the serial interval of COVID, day five, through, there's three infectious people from the previous iteration. That may lead to nine new infections and so on. And we run that over and over and over. Our, our modeling we did for 300 days. And we can see it, like it's quite, you know, there's a lot of kind of complexity that goes into it, but the story is quite kind of easy to understand. And so we run that a bunch of times and we look at the outcomes at varying uh, uh, vaccination rates. So here, and I'll run through all of these kind of funny looking charts uh, that we've presented in our report. If there's 50% of the population who is vaccinated and relatively low virus transmissibility, so a starting rate of four, um, what's gonna happen? The top left chart there, vaccination levels when opening um, the population of the, uh, sorry, the proportion of the population vaccinated, our models, in our model, people continue to be vaccinated up to a point of 90%, but that happens quite slowly. We see on the third chart there, the median scenario of daily cases. We could kind of see an explosion of cases. The vaccines aren't enough to reduce transmission. The ref remains relatively high for long enough that cases kind of explode. Um, the cumulative number of infections, well, actually, sorry, on the fourth chart, you can see the reproduction number over time. Um, so it starts off at maybe 1.6, 1.7, um, and stays really high for you know, 180 days or 150 days, um, which is long enough for lots and lots of people to become infected. Bottom left there, the current number of ICU patients. So we're using that length of stay for each person that goes into the ICU um, and then keeping them there for, for, for that long, um, which is why your kind of, your ICU capacity can get quite quickly overwhelmed, even if a large number of people are vaccinated. And I think it's important here to say that like, we don't, this isn't a prediction, like we don't think this will happen. Um, in fact, what will happen, you know, what we think will happen is cases rise to what policymakers deem to be an unacceptable level. ICU capacity gets stretched, maybe at day 100, day 120, and then they're going to introduce restrictions, um, kind of introduce lockdowns. This is what we saw in the UK throughout 2020 um, with their, their kind of being, Letting, letting loose and, and then um, kind of locking down for months on end uh, to, to make sure they didn't overwhelm their healthcare system. Um, our model also lets us kind of explore running a bunch of different simulations, this relationship between ref and vaccine level. Um, so you can see here on the top left, if you start with a ref of three, uh, you can maybe get around about 70% uh, your, your ref down to one. 70% um, of the population vaccinated. This is whole population, not just the eligible population. Uh, you know, we acknowledge that kids do transmit uh, COVID, so they, they should be included in your population count. Um, on the bottom right there, the starting ref of six, um, we see you kind of 
they have to get closer to 90%. But this is, you know, we don't need to get to one. We don't need to reach quote unquote herd immunity uh, for everything to be fine. We just need to get the ref down to an acceptable level. And we explore this um, when in, in our situation of an 80% of the population fully vaccinated. So this scenario, um, you know, age, is, uh, age stratified vaccination coverage. So older people are much more likely to be vaccinated. That's good. That offer, offers them lots of protection and also mirrors the kind of trends that we're seeing um, in Australia and, and overseas. And so what happens then? What happens, you know, we run our model, 80% of the population fully vaccinated. In this scenario, the ref or the starting ref is five uh, without, without vaccines. And it's like a pretty rosy scenario. So the median scenario daily cases doesn't top around about 30 that's because in the second chart there the reproduction number over time is never really much above one cumulative um, numbers of infections continue to rise so we still have you know five or five ten thousand cases um o o over the year but that's relatively small the cumulative number of deaths uh you know although it's any any death is bad it, it, it is it is quite low and icu capacity never kind of gets near being stretched. It's a little bit different. So we just changed one assumption here. We're just changing, we're kind of saying, what, what if in this world the ref is six, uh, the starting ref is six without vaccines? So your median scenario daily cases, much higher, but you know, maybe not too bad. Um, the reproduction number over time, we start off with a ref of about 1.2. Um, and that continues to decline, both as more people get vaccinated and because more people get infected. And in our model, somebody who is infected can't be infected again. Um, that's that's one of one of our assumptions. Um, the cumulative number of infections kind of tops does does rise above a million, but the current number of ICU patients doesn't like it's still bad. Like that is still very costly, um, but it's not. It doesn't overwhelm the healthcare system. If instead, so we look now to ref of six, but without vaccine, sorry, ref of six without vaccines, but only 70% of the population is vaccinated, uh, the story changes. We do get uh, up to 200,000 cases a day. The ref is, the starting ref is quite high at 1.7. Um, you're seeing lots of ICU use kind of three, four, five times as much as our capacity. Number of deaths is about 15,000. And importantly, a good chunk of those, so more than 15% are people who were vaccinated. Vaccination does, of course, protect you from substantially protect you from going to the hospital and going uh, and, and dying. But you know, if you have eight million infections, uh, a low probability of a large number, you know, you're going to get lots of lots of those cases. And then you know, repeated maybe seventy percent of the ref of five. So we can kind of run these simulations over and over and over. This one kind of looks okay. Uh, and it, this is what we did for our model. Uh, in, in the report was present the outcomes of different scenarios. Um, so here, the ref on the left-hand side, four, five, six, that's the starting ref, so starting ref without vaccines. Um, we look at daily cases, ICUs and deaths. And our kind of conclusion from this, like that's the point of this modeling is to kind of have a, a, a useful conclusion or a useful insight is that kind of you do need to get up to 80% vaccination coverage to protect yourself against a high ref. Now, we don't know what the ref of Delta is in an Australia with much, uh, without any restrictions, or without any public, or without many public health interventions. Uh, so we, we kind of, we don't know. It could be four, five, six. The Delta Institute, for instance, uses an R naught of eight and then reduces that significantly with tracking and tracing. Um, we, 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 we don't know. And that's something we're going to have to um, kind of learn more about. Uh, as as the year goes on and as Delta continues to spread, because um, it will change kind of what you need to do. So that is the COVID modeling. I will um, pass on to Annika, um, who is going to run through uh, our vaccination modeling. Excellent. Thanks, Will. So, yeah, the second question here is really, okay, well, we've got this 80% target. Is it really feasible? Can we can we do that in Australia? And how, if so, how quickly can we get there? So, what do we need to think when we ask this question? So, firstly, are there su supply constraints? Are there enough vaccine doses available? How quickly are they arriving? 
what are the logistical limitations or challenges for getting vaccines into arms? Um, and then on the demand side, are enough people wanting to get a vaccine? What are the rates of hesitancy and uptake? How do they vary between age groups? Um, you know, to what extent can those can people be persuaded to get vaccinated? What does inter, what do international examples tell us? So this is really kind of the framework that we came at uh, asking uh, this question, and then and then we built a model to see uh, how um, how quickly we can get there. So I'll just kind of run through both those supply supply constraints uh, we looked at and then the demand. So on the supply side, uh, we saw here that. This is the kind of uh, data we got from the Department of Health, and it shows that we have a lot of vaccines coming into Australia. It's, it's, it's been a slow start to the rollout for sure, and a lot of that has been due to supply issues, but this is shortly will be overcome. Uh, we've just had a new plan that's been released this week from the government that showed that um, everyone will be eligible to get a vaccine or, or everyone over 16 um, by October. So you can really see it's beginning to spike and there being a lot of vaccines available. So if we want to get to this 80% target, we can reach that really soon. Uh, and just even with Pfizer alone by the end of the year. Uh, and then the other question around supply is, okay, so we've got the doses, but do we have the logistics in place? Do we have the enough um, workforce uh, and what are the kind of challenges in, in rolling it out on the ground? Um, the federal government's plan in July uh, still showed that they were relying heavily on GPs to, to get doses out there. So you can see that many more doses are going to GPs in the red bars than are going to state vaccination hubs. Um, while GPs are a really important part of the plan, they're not um, as good at scaling and ensuring mass vaccination. Up to the next. So if you have a look here, um, if you keep going, yeah. So essentially what we're saying is that we need a really diversified strategy for this vaccine rollout. Well, we can't just rely on GPs. Not everyone necessarily has a GP either. So we need to think about more creative ways and governments really need to take this on, both uh, Commonwealth and state, how they're going to get mass vaccines out there as quickly as possible. Uh, so in our report, we run through how we can ramp that up. Um, so we, we were kind of thinking, you know, the, the sky is the limit, we're looking at international examples of what we can do. And the good news uh, is as well is that now with the, with the recent vaccine plan that the government released this week, they have actually taken a lot of these on. So we'll do a jump to the next slide. Uh, you can see that uh, if, if you go to the ticks, they've actually incorporated a whole bunch of these recommendations in. So you can see that the government is starting to see that they really need to think broadly and be creative about how they can get vaccines out there, even with mobile clinics, drive throughs and stadiums and schools and workplaces. And also uh, there needs to be mechanisms in place so that those who find it harder to access vaccines can get the time off work. Uh, have reminders um, or incentives to try and get them to the clinic. So with that, it seems that there are many opportunities. If there's enough supply, there are many opportunities to get doses into arms. So the supply side isn't really an issue. What is really then the next question is, are there, are there enough people who want to get vaccinated? And this is survey data that shows that um, consistently Australians are by and large keen to get vaccinated. There are only about 10% of people, uh, which is that red band up the top, that consistently say, oh, we don't want to get vaccinated. Um, and yeah, there's always that kind of group in the community that are uh, against other types of vaccinations as well. But they're a really small proportion. And it's more this proportion in the middle, um, this orange band, which we call the movable middle, are people who want to get vaccinated but are still on the fence, don't see the urgency in it, um, but I need maybe a bit more communication about around safety of vaccines. But it shows really that an 80% target is achievable because if we can get um, those people who want to get vaccinated but not straight away um, vaccinated, then, um, yeah, that's it's something we can achieve. And, and you can also see really interestingly that more recently, although its hesitancy has kind of been going up and down and it responds very much to the confidence that the government also displays in vaccines and we've seen issues over time around communication in vaccines but you can see that recently 
more people want to get vaccinated quickly. And in particularly in New South Wales, we've seen a huge drop in the number of people that were hesitant about vaccination and kind of record levels of people wanting to get vaccinated. Next slide. And there are also many things that evidence shows and survey data is showing that we can that we can move this middle movable middle and get them this 80% target. So this is evidence, uh, survey evidence that looked at what would persuade people to get vaccinated. And they answered that they needed more evidence about effectiveness. Um, they wanted to see a successful use and also needed to be um, better communicated through different channels and trusted voices. So it, you know, this shows that around half of people that was surveyed as being hesitant said that evidence about effectiveness would convince them. So this is showing that we can shift this group over time using different strategies and targeting different reasons for their concerns. Next. So this shows also that we need a, um, the incentives such as um, uh, a lottery, which we propose in our report, or other, other me mechanisms to try and get people out of their house and um, to a vaccination hub. Um, there are often just uptake barriers. People are keen, but they don't want to do it straight away, or they're finding it hard to find the time. So we want to make it as easy as possible for people to get vaccinated. And um, incentives are one way to do that. And it, and Governments can also introduce more stringent things like uh, vaccine passports. So that's where um, only vaccinated people can attend restaurants or travel interstate or attend sporting events. And this is uh, also another tool that can be used to try and get more people vaccinated. As you can see here, uh, 20 to 30 percent of people who don't uh, were unsure and willing to get vaccinated said that that would be convincing for them. And it's also a public health measure to try and reduce um, COVID in these more high-risk settings. Next. International examples also show that, uh, you know, the in vaccination rates are increasing and uh, an 80% is possible, especially given these countries, younger children haven't, or children in general haven't been vaccinated yet. So that'll give a massive boost. Next. And interestingly, also in the UK, we have also seen these massive um, differences in age um, groups. So particularly older people are very keen to get vaccinated, which is important because they're more vulnerable to um, hospitalisation and dying from COVID. And uh, we're seeing similar trends in Australia as well. Next, please. Yeah, you can see that here that in the over 70s cohort, there are only about 4% of uh, people that uh, don't want to get vaccinated. And you saw early in Will's modelling, we had an assumption that not up to 95% of older people could get vaccinated. Oh, sorry, in that group. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and so you can see here that once we kind of pulled all that together and we looked at the research um, and plug that into uh, this logistic curve. So we looked at the starting point here, what percent of Australians were already uh, vaccinated um, in their different age groups. Uh, we plugged in the supply constraints. Of, we can see that uptick in October where everyone will begin to have access. And um, also then the kind of rate of uptake um, to a similar kind of trend that we saw in the, in the UK example, uh, we saw that we could get to the 80% mark uh, by the end of the year. And the caveat to this is that uh, this is assuming that over under 12s would be able to get vaccinated to get that 80% whole of population target. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see uh, if we don't include the under 12s because they haven't actually been approved yet for any vaccine, this, the, the trials are still un undergoing. Uh, if, 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 and if those approvals don't happen before the end of the year, we can still meet this target by March. And I, and I guess the thing to note here really is that this is kind of the information that we're using at the time. And uh, this is just it showing that there is a plausible scenario that we can reach this 80% and what the government does and how quickly they roll it out. You know, it could be even quicker. And if we the rollout doesn't work very well, it'll be even, it might be even slower. And so it's, it's contingent on what the government does. Uh, and so finally, how can our, um, these models that we've put together inform uh, decision makers? So firstly, we can reach a vaccination uh, coverage target um, that will drive Delta down to below one. 
Uh, and, and based on Will's modelling, uh, we saw that it's important that if there is full vaccination because the evidence shows that both doses are important. There needs to be age stratification because older people are more vulnerable. And uh, as the 70% uh, scenario show, if we, if we open up, we can only open up once and we open up too early and don't use any further major public health restrictions, uh, COVID will continue to be rampant, rampant if the vaccination levels aren't high enough. So it's important that we have um, suppress COVID until we reach that target. And then once we do reach that target, continue vaccination rates over time. And just finally, to reiterate that point Will was saying about uncertainty and evolving evidence, it's important that decision makers also take that into account because we're just using the information we have now. Things might change, there might be a new variant, and so we need to be uh, open to adapting plans over time. And maybe we'll leave it there. Um, Will, then we can jump to uh, questions. Sure thing. Sounds good. Um, we might uh, start with the top. So the first question is from Roberts. Uh, says lots of debate recently around the Odie versus the Grand Institute modelling, 70%, 80%, et cetera. Uh, can you talk more about the differences and assumptions? Um, so there, we, we, we Grand Institute and Doherty were exploring kind of different questions. And I think a really big, I think the key driver in the differences between these results, or kind of, you know, the differences in, in kind of the modeled scenarios is um, the transmission rate. So that, that, that effective reproduction number um, that, is, uh, that is used in, in our modeling and, in, and their modeling. So we use three different REFs, uh, reproduction values um, in, the, in the community, four, five, and six. Um, the Doherty Institute modeling kind of uses lots of mobility data. They, they kind of, they try and work out what the ref would be rather than just exploring different scenarios. So they start with an R naught of eight and then use very, what they call perfect, was it Annika, the perfect trap, trace, isolate and quarantine. Optimal systems. was the terminology Optimal, they used. Right? optimal track chase isolate systems to bring the ref down. And that brings the ref down a lot. So it goes from eight all the way down to about 3.6. Um, we, there's, there's, they're kind of, and in, in that reduction, it's both test uh, track trace isolate quarantine and also base level restrictions. Um, that's not, well, it's, that's not well, hasn't been well defined by the government what that actually means. Um, we didn't want, or we kind of, we didn't use that level of restrictions in our modeling. And so we started with a higher ref to allow people more freedom. So I think kind of what you've got to assume from the Doherty modeling is that that test tra uh, track and trace, all of that stuff is happening while there's lots of cases in the community. Um, it's just quite, um, you know, it's a huge, that'll be a huge effort for contact traces. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think our kind of key assumption there is different is in, in that we think the virus will be more transmissible in the community uh, because we want um, fewer restrictions. Um, we kind of want to, want to live in a world with, with, with fewer restrictions. That was kind of our, our goal. Um, they, uh, uh, the, the Doherty Institute, you know, they, it's a big, complex model, big expert team. Um, you know, they've, they've certainly done a very good job, uh, but we just kind of were exploring different things. Um, next one from Tom, did your work try to understand the risk of an outbreak posed by different levels of international arrivals and subsequent quarantine arrangements? So um, it's, a, it's a good point on quarantine. I think with the, we, we did explore different in the technical appendix. I think you can look at, for example, figure uh, 2.12 and 2.15, they, they're kind of two different scenarios. One has one new uh, in, introduced case per day. Um, and the other one has 100 uh, new cases per day. And we did that just to explore the difference. And really what happens, what drives kind of the consequence of that is um, your, your new cases kind of go up much more quickly, but they're still constrained by the ref. And so if you start with a higher, if you're kind of introducing lots of cases into a community that has a high ref, that's going to accelerate um, the, 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 the accelerate transmission. Um, but if you introduce uh, that, that's going to that's going to happen anyway, even if you just introduce one new case, because um, local transmission will take off as well. Um, and so, 
you know, it, 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 really what we need to focus on is kind of getting the ref right in Australia. So in, in all the different communities in Australia, we need to get the ref down to a point that it doesn't, you know, really spread that much. Um, and then you can actually introduce cases and it doesn't matter. And so different levels of international arrivals and quarantine arrangements, they're really necessary now. Um, you know, we, we've had a pretty, uh, I would say kind of disastrous quarantine system so far um, that, you know, that should be improved. But also remember that, you know, if we're letting in 10,000 people a month now or something, we used to let in or kind of ha have uh, 2.1, 2.2 million people arriving every single month into Australia. Um, so we're well below any sort of normal. And I think it's important, like the goal really not just, you know, over the next kind of couple of months, the goal really is to kind of get to a point where you can open up the borders um, without any, any sort of restrictions. Um, that's, that's kind of our goal. Uh, Richard Father says, how sensitive are the outcomes to the assumption of the effectiveness of vaccines in reducing transmission? So yeah, so our, our model, um, our, our model uses kind of this, uh, a, a paper, that looked at the attack rate for partially vaccinated people, um, household, the house, household attack rate for partially vaccinated people who are, vac who are infected and, and, and do have a vaccine. Um, that, that reduction is about 50%. So that, you know, they infect half as many people um, is kind of what the evidence is showing. That data was not for Delta. It was also only for one dose of the vaccine, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca had similar outcomes. Um, so that, that's kind of what that, that variable is. It's set at 50% in our model. Um, we, we, we didn't um, really have the space or, or time to explore different uh, values there. Obviously, if you reduce that, if people who, who are vaccinated um, and infectious, if they uh, transmit to as many people as unvaccinated people, um, that, that's going to you know, mean that your number of people you have to vaccinate goes up. Um, but it's kind of, that's unlikely given vaccines do reduce your viral load. Um, so, you know, we, we reckon it is some number, you know, some, some, some low level, but that, that would be worth exploring. Um, so Tom Crowley, uh, asks, has the reaction to Grattan's modeling and Doherty's in the last week taught you anything about tips and or traps for communicating complex modeling to a general audience that isn't across all the detail? I think it's really important. Um, you know, we, 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 at Grattan, we work very hard at making our work accessible, um, but also don't treat, I think really like take the time and step through things. People don't treat the public or your, your audience like, they can't understand things. You've got to make this complex stuff easily digestible and, and kind of, you, you have to kind of give, give people the benefit, give people the detail so they can kind of work it out for, them, for themselves and you've got to kind of guide them through that. It's really important. Um, you know, so we, we, we've had lots of people interested in our model. Obviously the whole nation is interested in the, the Doherty modeling. It's really good. Uh, they're, Technical paper that the Doherty Institute put out. Um, it's, uh, that, that's that's pretty good um, in, in that in, in terms of its complexity. Uh, it could be summarized maybe a little a little bit more nicely uh, for a general audience. And I think the the public kind of deserves that. That's kind of what what people want, what they're after. Um, we're all kind of we all want to know exactly how to think about these things because again, modeling is about kind of understanding the world making better decisions and kind of you taking them through that process is just as important as kind of just showing them or even more important than just showing them outcomes. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's, that's very important. Great question, Tom Crowley. Um, Danny has a question, Annika, that you might want to answer. So this is, does your model consider the vaccination prioritization strategy when set setting a starting point as a distribution of vaccine rate across the population. Age group would be different. Um, so, uh, well, I just don't, so our model, um, our, our, our model doesn't, our, our model does uh, kind of, we run a single model that um, in terms of that 
vaccine distribution where older people are much more likely to be vaccinated than younger people. Uh, we run some, um, some scenarios where, for instance, kids don't get a, a vaccine. Um, and you can kind of think that they're, they're all in the, the technical appendix. You can kind of think about what would happen, say, if not, no kids are vaccinated um, in a model, but more older people are, and you get much more transmission um, uh, uh, amongst children. So you'd have, for a given case, you'd have lower ICU use and lower death rates. Um, obviously, our model doesn't include kind of the non-hospital, non-death health consequences of COVID, like long COVID, which, you know, kind of absolutely deserves further research. Um, so, so setting a different starting point to say, yeah, yeah, not, not include, not include kids. Um, yeah, well, you're going to see a lot of transmission among those, those groups, those networks, schools, um, but may, maybe for a given vaccination level, lower, um, lower, lower, lower health consequences. Is there anything you want to add, Annika? Yeah, I would just add that the it's the Doherty modelling in particular looked at this question of between now and reaching this level of um, 70 and 80 percent that they said um, looked at the different kind of approach that you could have for targeting different age groups, and they found that if you once you've kind of got your older vulnerable populations vaccinated, you can um, you should be targeting more working age younger people because they're more likely to transmit. Uh, COVID. And so I think that is informing how the government's going to manage their rollout between now and then. But we were looking more at the um, what, you know, would need to happen beyond um, 70% and, and then, well, sorry, 80%. Once you get to 80%, um, you've got the makeup of the population, you know, the, the different age stratification of vaccination and how that then would play out and what needs to happen after that. Um. We have another question from Nicholas. Uh, do you discern between vaccinated cases, hospitalizations, and deaths versus unvaccinated cases? So we do do that. We look some of maybe one of the final outputs. For everyone else, I realize we're past time, so feel free to not only um, we'll hang around for a little bit longer and answer some questions. Um, so I say here in this scenario, Nicholas. Um, the one, two, three, fourth panel vaccinated share of cases and deaths. Um, it's about 50% in this scenario of the 8 million, about 50% of those are, um, were, were vaccinated um, and about 16% of the deaths were vaccinated. So we do show that in all of our modeling. Uh, and I think Dan asks about the flu um, and comparisons with the flu. It was interesting as well in the um, Prime Minister's uh, press conference the other day around the Doherty modelling, he also referred to how, um, you know, the ideal scenario is to have, well, not the ideal, but like the more acceptable scenario would be to have COVID cases um, and deaths as, or deaths at least, um, to similar levels to the flu. Uh, and we saw this in um, the actual slide deck that the Doherty modelling um, put together where there's about, I think, a thousand deaths um, per year is kind of an average flu season. And, and then, yes. yeah, and they can and, and also, and, and also 300, 350,000 ish cases. Uh, these are recorded cases of the flu. Uh, obviously, a lot of the flu goes unrecorded. Um, so, that, you know, that's likely to be a pretty substantial undercount. Um, but yeah, it's so, you know, hundreds of thousands of cases. And I think kind of, you know, we know that. COVID without a vaccine is much, much, much more deadly than the flu. Um, with, a, with a vaccine, that kind of changes the story. And you, you do want to get to a point where you can start thinking about the health consequences of COVID rather than cases. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, the, the, that, the, those kind of comparisons. Are, are, they, I, don't, I don't think the flu comparison was useful last year, uh, but with a vaccine, they, it does uh, become a little bit more useful. And also just as a kind of, as a point, we've had lots of discussions about this in our team of a point of like, what does is, what is kind of society accept um, in, in terms of, of kind of uh, disease and, and death from disease? Um, you know, that's one measure. There's lots of ways you can kind of answer that question. Uh, I'll go to Sarah Jill's um, question around incentives uh, and financial incentives. Uh, so yeah, we did. I did look at um, some research around 
financial incentives and particularly looked at the scenarios, what's happening in the US. Um, there's a lot of research in particular on cash incentives in the US and also uh, lotteries. There's been a whole range of lotteries in different US states, uh, for example, in Ohio. And um, we've seen that from in both cases, whether it's a lottery or cash, uh, people, it does um, persuade a whole number of people to get um, vaccinated. Uh, it's usually those people that are already intending to get vaccinated, but maybe down the track. So this is something that can get them out the door. Um, in terms of uh, cash incentives, there was just a research study by Melbourne Institute. They did a survey that I think came out yesterday showing that uh, in, uh, people aged 50 and over, about half of them said that people that would be kind of willing to get vaccinated, but um, not immediately, they would be willing to, uh, that, that would convince them to go out the door. So it's, it's, um, in it. So it's, 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 it's a one tool and I think it's quite an effective tool, but it's not the silver bullet. Uh, in lo lotteries in particular are interesting because um, the way that people view lotteries is different to a cash incentive. I think they kind of um, see that there's a huge potential win with a lottery. So it's uh, some studies show that that's even more persuasive for people to get vaccinated. Um. Paul asks, uh, Paul, Paul and Kerry both have questions about ICU and that's um, good because I, I, ICU is really interesting and I've learned a lot uh, about ICU. Um, so Paul asks, does ICU capacity, uh, does that figure assume that everyone in the ICU has COVID? Um, so that range there, you can see it on this chart, the bottom left, um, that we've put that range at about 2,000 to 7,500. Um, the bot that bottom range is about half of our capacity uh, of our kind of non-surge ICU capacity. Um, that two thousand, um, which kind of like that's still really bad. You know, each person if you talk to kind of people who work in ICU or run ICUs, like they're they're never empty. Like they're not just sitting around. People are always in them. You, you know, so if you have fifty percent of your ICU used. For, um, for COVID, it means that you're not doing other things. You're canceling elective surgeries. You're doing a bunch of other stuff. You kind of you're not doing a bunch of other stuff that you other otherwise would be. And so there's real health consequences for people who don't have COVID but who need health attention. Once you start stretching that ICU capacity, the 7,500 figure at the top. Um, Scott Morrison announced that as our surge capacity about two weeks ago. Um, uh, you know, that's a really, you, you know, we're pushing it there. Like if you think of, like we don't want, if we, if we can help it, we don't want to use our 7,500 surge capacity for ICU um, because that means setting up temporary facilities. That means taking an anaesthetist who would otherwise be doing anaesthetizing um, and, and kind of making them be a, a, an ICU nurse or ICU um, medical doctor, it kind of you, you're diverting a huge amount of resources away from other health services. Um, you're kind of, it's, it's kind of, that's not the world you want to be in. So, you know, that ICU range is large because there's, it's a kind of a, it, it kind of depends on what you define as, I, you know, ICU capacity. Um, but if you want to have anything like normal, you certainly wouldn't go above fifty percent, and you know even that's kind of stretching it. Um, Kerry asks, uh, while well, capacity of ICU is important, should another factor be capacity of contact tracing? This seems to be a factor for what's happened in New South Wales. Absolutely, yeah. So contact tracing breaks down very quickly uh, with new cases, hundreds of thousands of new cases. Um, you know, if you think if you have one case and that case has 10 contacts or 50 contacts, that's doable. But if you have a thousand cases in a day and a finite co contact tracing team without an app that is useful, um, yeah, you, you simply run out of resources, cases don't get tracked, um, and that increases the ref. Like you're stop, you, you know, where contact tracing is used to break those chains of transmission, if you can't do that, um, because your, your contact tracing is stretched, then you're going to see more chains of transmission. And so that's, you know, one question I think that needs to be um, kind of, to, well, just, you know, now, now that we kind of un un understand that, it's important, like where the Doherty Institute modelling 
uses that um, that R naught, it's then reduced through track and trace. Like that is, is a dynamic. That should be a dynamic kind of figure where track and trace gets uh, gets less good as more and more cases happen. You kind of can't run an effective track and trace system with you know twenty thousand cases a day. Um, uh, uh, Serato Jewel asks, did our modeling consider the fact that the proportion of Australian population may be vaccinated with Moderna? Um, uh, good question. No, we didn't. Um, we, we didn't model Moderna. We just modeled Pfizer. The data for Pfizer, oh, sorry, just modeled Pfizer and AstraZeneca. The data for Pfizer and AstraZeneca first and second dose against the Delta strain is relatively good. Um, well, and becoming better. Uh, studies out of the UK and out of uh, um, out of Canada and, and Israel as well. That's kind of we we, we yeah we we didn't branch into Moderna. That's gonna you know if you add a third vaccine into the mix, that's just uh, it's another set of characteristics. Um, the Moderna vaccine looks pretty good, um, so you know maybe more closer to to Pfizer in terms of protection against infection. But once that data against the Delta strain comes out, we could. We could plug it in, but we we didn't model that explicitly. Um, so I'm just going through these. Uh, Fred asked, to what extent are your models affected by older COVID info pre Delta? Um, so so I assume kind of what you mean there is like how much how much are we relying on um, on character virus characteristics and data that is pre Delta? Um, and so I think we, very good question, we rely on pre-Delta data for ICU use um, in, in Australia. I, 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 ICU use is, like, we do that because ICU use is very country dependent, um, you know, different set systems of ICU and, and, and kind of different thresholds and, and triage, et cetera. It means that kind of we really, I want to prioritize the way that we use ICU um, rather than other countries' systems of ICU, which means I wanted to use Australian data. And of course, we don't have much Delta um, data at the moment. Um, and and that, that was, I think, from memory, that's kind of the only thing in the model that uses pre Delta um, data. Uh, Julie asks, any thoughts or opinions from your team about? The paper released by Treasury this week, economic impacts of various COVID scenarios. Uh, I actually haven't read it. I didn't. Uh, I was reading the Doherty modeling instead. Um, uh, feel free to send Brendan Coates at Grant Institute a message about it. He'll answer it for you. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Same. My main conclusion is yes, they're <laughs> they're expensive and they'll get less. Um, you know, the, the fewer we you have them, as more and more people get vaccinated, the least the less costly it'll get. Right, um, and then Jesse asked, does your model account for different testing methodologies or algorithms? I'm not sure what that means. Um, so, sorry. Uh, Claire, does any of the modeling take into account how things might be different if we got serious about recognizing airborne transmission? So HEPA filters in school. So all of these, so Claire, that's a really good point. Remember, uh, so our model takes REF as, a, as, a, as an input, um, so ref of four or five or six. Um, and obviously, like what kind of what we can deduce from our modeling at least, like the lower the ref is, the more effective your vaccines are going to be. Um, you know, the the less kind of consequence of that spread. And so if you do things like HEPA filters in schools and you know, ventilation audits, as Claire's suggesting, um, all of those things are going to reduce how COVID spreads. And actually, what we need to build up is a kind of is a bank of unobtrusive measures, unobtrusive ways we could reduce the spread of COVID. You know, rather than going into lockdown all the time, we kind of want to use lots of vaccines and lots of unobtrusive measures uh, that kind of aren't too cumbersome. Um, and, and kind of that's how we want to deal with COVID from, from now on. And so things like, um, you know, as you say, getting serious about airborne transmission, like things like that are really, really useful. Um, our model doesn't explicitly model those effects. So. 
I would also note that that kind of thing, in, in the short term at least, we should really be focusing on uh, hotel quarantine and ensuring that we've got making changes to hotel quarantine um, and in, you know, improving ventilation standards across each certain territory in getting negative pressure into the rooms. And there's, there's many different ways that we can reduce our airborne transmission in hotel quarantine, reduce the leaks. While we don't have the population uh, a large proportion of the population vaccinated, it's really important that we reduce any leaks coming out of um, quarantine. Um, and Richard asks, uh, is there a plan to valid validate the modeling estimates as time goes on? So uh, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I think what's, I, I hope we don't do that soon. I hope we don't get the opportunity to va validate the model soon because I hope we don't open up at vaccination rates of 50% or 60%. Um, so yeah, I think we can serve our model is certainly, our model is like quite simple in that it just like, it spends a lot of time looking at this kind of interaction between transmission and vaccine effectiveness and the reduction in death and hospitalization from that. Um, so yeah, we'll, 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 we'll maybe, you know, when we, when we op open up, we'll certainly see how it goes. Um, but of course, like when, when we open up or, you know, in months time, this morning, like somebody sent me a big um, international meta-analysis about ICU use for the Delta strain this morning. Like, there's, we're going to learn lots more and we'll tweak the model accordingly um, as, as the year goes on. This is kind of the best that we know now. All right. I think we'll end it up there. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. I, I, I think the kind of the public interest in these um in in COVID and in the modeling around COVID is really good it's really really good and I'm, I'm so excited to see so many yeah people kind of engaged with it it's really important um I I think uh, I hope it can kind of help you think about COVID differently or kind of make make yeah make, make decisions um yeah thanks very much and please feel free to get in touch if anyone's got further questions all right thank you thank you